All right, everyone. Good evening. Some folks might still be coming in and settling in. Hi, friends at home. Nice to see you. Yeah. As usual, but I think even more, I'm so happy to be here with you all. That's really nice and definitely feels like a refuge from all the things in the world out there to just come here and get to practice together. Um, for folks, it's their first time. This is the Well of Being Wednesday, and I'm Eve Ekman, and we'll be guiding us through some meditation and discussion. We are going to finish the book tonight. It's been, uh, been, been really struggling with that. I've been wanting to keep it going, but it feels time. Um, and it's a text that we've been just making our way through. It's really short. I think the audio version of it is maybe two hours, but there's such richness in the teaching and very much a kind of cyclical nature to the way the teachings continue to fold back into one another. The teacher is Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, and he actually lives over in the East Bay. He's a Tibetan teacher in the Bon tradition. Um, he graced us with his presence. When was that? A month or two ago? It was really fun to have him join us. And um, yeah, and I will let him know that we are finally finishing today, making our way through. And last week, we kind of reconnected to the real the source of, of what this book is intending to do and that's to help us get more free from pain and not the kind of pain that is you know your torn meniscus or your difficult shoulder but the identification with pain what he calls the pain body or the pain identity and i i love this he you know very simply says, um, uh, kind of, there is only one cause, and he calls this pain or this, uh, this aspect of identifying with the pain of how we kind of push against reality. We try to change reality. We try to make it different. He says that this creates soul loss, and the practices that we do here are a soul retrieval. And that term is used not only um, in the Bond tradition, it's actually used by many indigenous traditions, this idea of reclaiming or kind of unveiling the goodness that's always already here. And he says, ultimately, there's only one cause of soul loss, and that is ignorance, a misunderstanding of the truth of who you are. And I just love the simplicity of that. We will talk about it in different ways. And he says that, just as there's only one cause, there's only one cure, and it's awareness. And when you fully realize the truth of your nature, that you are unbounded sacred space, infinite awareness, and genuine warmth, you will achieve full liberation from suffering. So that's worth aiming for. Tonight, we'll revisit that, and we'll start with a shorter practice. I want us to work and revisit a practice we've often done here in this Wednesday night, which is the handshake with emotion practice. This is a really great practice for being with um, the felt memory of a difficult emotion and learning how to stay. I mean, it's like the whole thing, just learning how to stay with it, not the, you know, hundred strategies we have to avoid or deny or distract that end up often creating their whole own constellation of difficulty we then have to unwind from. But before we get into the handshake practice and kind of um, how that relates to loosening the pain identity, I want us to start with the main practice we've been doing here. It's such a simple practice. If it's your first night, no problem. It will, uh, I hope, have very clear resonance. And this is the simple practice of finding a way to settle our body, speech, and mind into their natural states. And even that invitation, even saying it, there can be kind of a, an inkling of relief or of peace, like the natural state of our body, speech, and mind. And that that's something, again, we're not trying to generate or achieve, but something we're just revealing. And the way that he describes the natural state of our, our body, speech, and mind is a body that actually finds a natural state of stillness. 
even though there is so much movement in the body, so much subtle undulation in the form body and in the subtle body, there is this way that we can choose to find stillness in the body and create an inner refuge from that. He also describes this natural state of the speech or kind of the inner narration as one in which we can choose silence. Again, they, there may be sounds outside. There will certainly be thoughts in the mind. When you recognize this kind of unbounded sacred space, and then the speech is just a little bit of kind of chatter within it. It becomes less the opaque way that we are experiencing the world and more kind of perforated, like, oh, the speech is just one thing happening here. I can find these little gaps in between that, these silence. And then in some ways, like the meta experience of settling is to find space. And that space that of the mind is warm. He would say space of the mind the heart center, the heart mind, it's not just, you know, this openness, it's this kind of sense of a warmth with what is met. And there's a really beautiful way that our inner experience builds. When we find like the stillness in the body, often what we experience is a sense of spaciousness. We're attending to the body. Well, oh, hello, there's a seat right there. Right next to you. Um, there's like a, a sense of spaciousness in the body, even when we turn towards stillness. And also there can be a sense of kind of emptiness, a lack of form when we start to settle into the silence. And with this settling in to, you know, the spaciousness and warmth, what we often find is this quality of light or the light of our awareness. Such an interesting difference to build from space, which can feel very nice and luxurious and open, but to this quality that's also bright within the spaciousness. Lots of words. So let's give it a try. So we'll do a shorter practice, talk a little bit about that, and then move into the longer practice, the handshake with emotion. And so take a moment and really find some sense of precision with the posture. It doesn't have to look a certain way, but just a sense of intentionally settling in, finding the uprightness of the spine, finding the softness through the face and the chest and the belly. Finding a place for the hands to rest naturally and gently, whether folded in your lap or placed on top of the legs. And whether the eyes are slightly open, allowing in some light, or they are closed, we have this inner posture of the gaze turning towards ourselves almost as though we were gazing at our own heart. And a couple of breaths to settle in here as we inhale, we imagine lengthening up through the spine. And as we exhale, we gently relax and release. And doing so and inhaling up the spine, and exhaling, allowing the mouth to be gently opened. And twice more, slowly inhaling and releasing. One more time, getting all the breath in and all the breath out.
And we begin our practice by settling the body in this natural state of stillness. Bringing all our attention and awareness to the body. And experiencing the sensory moments of the body. Each tactile experience. And yet within the myriad subtle tactile experiences, this overall experience, this holding within stillness. It could be a quality of the attention and awareness dropping from the head centers down into the belly center. And feeling the sense of awareness throughout the body. The more we attend to the body, the more resolution we experience through the body. It's almost as though the body becomes bigger and the perimeter softer. And we find that stillness as we would with a clear mountain lake. Still no wind whatsoever. You can see directly to the bottom and there's so much activity within it. But overall, that quality of stillness permeates the entire experience of the body. If we get carried away by a thought or a sound, we just return, doing so gently, kindly. A couple more moments here, really steeping ourselves in this quality of stillness in the body.
to support the moving towards silence. We can focus on the subtle sensations of breath, allowing our attention and awareness to fully enter the breath. Noticing and holding closely to the breath through the inhale and exhale. And if we do this, it becomes the full experience. No room for the other thoughts, memories, and images, naturally settling the inner speech to silence. It really doesn't matter how many times we get carried away or distracted. Every time we return, we can re-energize, drop even more deeply, connecting to the breath and following the breath, allowing the inner speech to settle, finding the gaps in between the thoughts. For the next three breaths, see if you can fully sustain your attention through the entire cycle of breath. And as we move to settle the mind in its natural state of warmth and openness, we let go of that focused attention on the breath. We could feel or imagine a sense of spacious awareness all around us. A sense of our awareness not only within the body, but around the body. And the warmth, a sense of implicit, intrinsic kindness saturating this awareness. It's not cold or clinical or searching. There's a warmth and openness.
And keep leaning back in the mind. Almost as though laying back and seeing the full expanse of the sky. The sky that surrounds us not only above, but also below. That much openness, that much vastness. Not limited by our thoughts, feelings, momentary senses. The awareness that permeates and holds all of that. Just coming home to rest in this natural experience. Of this vast, warm sense of the mind. Just a couple more moments here, and connecting to the stillness, the silence, this warm openness, as much as possible remaining breath by breath. Thank you for your practice. So many supportive conditions here with the walking and the singing. <laughs> Friends at home, we had some help from the uh, from the environment here. Yeah, good way to remember where we are. So I know for. For many of us, we've been doing these practices for a while. Um, for some of you that might be new, just want to make a little space if there's any questions or comments on that practice. And if you would like to um, make a comment or a question in this room, please use the mic so friends at home can hear you. <clears throat> You're floating in spacious awareness. <laughs> That's good. Also good. Yeah, you know, I find time is so weird, this, you know, oppressive construct we live under. I don't remember when we started this book. Is it six months? Anybody? I know, I should know. But however long we've been doing it, I do feel this practice, like, keeps opening, Um and then all it's like interwoven to my other practices and then coming back to it. He adds so much to it. You know, he has the 
you know, these the simple aspects of finding the stillness and finding the silence. Then he layers in, you know, the the body of emptiness, the body of light, the body of manifestation. He layers in the wisdom qualities. And it's kind of hard to hold these, I'd think, all at once. But when you start kind of resonating or practicing with them, it does you start to feel like qualitatively there's a different sense when we're focusing on these different aspects of settling in. And there's something um, settling in the body, especially that feels like the real shift, you know, that really takes you there. I experimented with trying the other way, starting with spaciousness, going to silence and stillness. Wasn't so good. <laughs> I get the order. I know spaciousness kind of interweaves all of them, but there's something about that oscillation, especially from silence to um, openness, where when you're really trying to hold attention in one place with the breath and then you open, like that's a very um, instructive way to feel like the boundary and then boundarylessness of our attention and awareness. That's what I noticed. Any other questions or comments on that practice? Yes, please. Um, I think I have some here. Hey, welcome. It won't be amplified, but just for folks online. Got it. Um, I, I was a little, I'm a little bit confused by what spacious awareness is. Um, I'm more, most comf like I'm most, I guess, well-versed or experienced in my very limited experience um, with sort of co the concentration practices yeah. of focusing on a specific object. Yeah. So um, I experienced when I was trying to look at spacious awareness, mm -hmm. like kind of a, a brightening, but also confusion. Yeah. Um, and and so that was that was cool. It was different from normally when I just try to do spacious awareness, I tend to go into dullness and like yes. get a little sleepy. Yes. Um, is that like the right thing or like, I don't know. Just yeah. I'm kind of and it. when there was that brightness, mm -hmm. like what else did you notice, if anything? Oh, oh yeah, right. The non-application microphone. Um, I guess like there, like I, I like visual feel the little brightness mm -hmm. and then like a sensation of like a little bit like, I think I just feel strange to say these words myself, but like a little bit of the PT sensation, like of like a flash of joyfulness in the brain, mm -hmm. but it was a little bit, I was like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Cause I yes. thought that was a concentration thing. Yes. So I thought that was something I'm consciously trying to avoid. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you for your question. What's your name? Elise. Elise. Um, and it is, you know, it's, this is, you know, coming from the Dzogchen approach. Right. And so a bit more of, you know, um, we can rest in this place, which is always already here and is spacious and open and aware. And, you know, I think for many years, people thought uh, that was a harder practice than focused attention on your breath. But I don't know what's harder than focused attention on your breath. It's really hard. It's really hard. And I do think we can get glimpses and then we kind of have the, oh, no, am I doing it right? Like the, the, but the glimpses, like the brightening, that sense of like, um, so wouldn't call it pity, but maybe like the, the equivalent would be kind of a, a, a bliss, right? So these are the same words pointing at when we are focused in our awareness and attention in one place, it is really joyful, whether that's a small place or like a vast place. So, so much of where we experience discomfort is in rumination, right? And kind of getting pulled here and pulled there um, in the mind. And I think when spacious awareness, uh, my, my very first teacher, Alan Wallace says, you have to have complete and utter existential relaxation. Right. And so it's, it's like, you just, every time I like, am I doing it right? Relax. Is this good? Relax and not relax dull. It's really great. You noticed because we can fall into a kind of dullness where it feels pretty good, but there's none of that brightness of our awareness and that dullness. Um, it's like sleep. It's good, but it won't actually help brighten as you describe, brighten the mind and train the mind. And there's a whole lot of ways to explain it through the neuroscience, but we don't need to. I think the first person experience of it can be so powerful. 
and then that often you know we often ask or have that kind of continued brightness or like high saturation um yeah it's a really and it really does take time to just be at ease with our mind that wants to make a concept or a construct or a question around it and just like okay what if i just continue relaxing these words are weird spacious awareness you know i don't know what that's supposed to mean luminous okay but we just kind of relax and relax and it's there right so um it's possible to experience and it's so sweet to be part of this you know, unbroken lineage for thousands of years where people have experienced just this. There's so many beautiful analogies of what this is. You know, it's the moonlight or um, all these different ways that we can understand. And and sometimes I actually have that quality where it's like, it's like a cool moonlight quality of spacious awareness, which is a really nice one to just start being curious about how that feels in the body and the mind and, um, to be curious about what does it do for the mind and the body and the heart? Like what is the experience or the quality of it? So thanks, Elise. Yeah. Is there another question or comment? I have a question. Sure. Hi, Grace. So the question is like surrounding what we do. Well, actually, I have a, a comment first. When you were saying, like, be in the openness and the silence and the stillness, it sounded a little bit like a Dungeons and Dragons, like setting the stage with the fog rolling in. Cool. I like that. Um, so I connected the two. And then, like, the actors would be, like, what the voices are doing, like, after that mm. in the silence and the stillness. So yeah, my neighbors are playing, so I kind of want to take, like, the, my character into whatever happens after that stage is set. Um, and then once... I can be silent and still you said that there's a long lineage of people doing this mm. so are they just like happy like they live their lives I'm not studying them directly yeah um, we're all trying to do this yeah and we practice frequently yeah so we must be residing within this space already and we can be aware of it so uh what so we're here yeah. I guess practicing yeah um, and is that uh the end is that the end meaning where uh the the aim of the, the the practice yeah the journey of the the life would not be the the goal right yes yeah any ideas what the goal might be <laughs> well, I, well there's no goal i guess um, well i mean that i think our i think really you know maybe not goal but the motivation is always bodhicitta or that like how do we show up with and for others mm -hmm. And so we practice well, not just to enjoy bliss. It's nice. It's great to have that sense, but so that we can be more available, but that doesn't have a prescriptive way. So I think people who are practitioners, they've gone about it in so many different ways. And I think there's so many different contemplative traditions where you see folks um, using what they've been able to generate internally to then share with others. But I like the Dungeons and Dragons analogy because I think it can be really helpful. There's a practice we've done here, the settling the mind in its natural state, which is kind of what we're doing through building up is, you know, being able to relax enough that you can like lean back in your mind. And sometimes the analogy is um, as though you were looking at a stage and the thoughts were like coming in front of the curtain and going back in. You know, so like kind of whatever works in terms of how do we how do we work with those thoughts that arise? Do we imagine them like the wave going back to the ocean or like I don't know Dungeons and Dragons, I gotta be honest, but um, <laughs> whoever, whatever arises there and comes back, I think it's I think it can be really nice to have a metaphor that works for us as long as we need it. And then we just touch the pure experience, like all the metaphors, all the scaffolding is so that we can just then like relax into it. Okay, great. Yeah, and like of, of these practitioners of all time, um, I think they show up in so many ways. You know, often it is, you know, there's the whole monastic tradition and then there's the householder tradition. So monastic tradition, you know, they live in the monasteries and they go about their life. But the household tradition, you know, carpenters and painters and all sorts of, um, you know, daily work in the world, like most of us, because I don't think anyone in here is a mastic. 
So no, we're all lay practitioners. Yeah, we're not monastics. So then, they're like I'm thinking like this practice belongs in, in the monastery, but it hmm. it doesn't. Yeah, belongs yeah. to all of us. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I think is so beautiful with like Rinpoche, you know, bringing these practices to everybody all over the world, right? And he's not he's not a monastic himself. Um, and I think a lot of the ways he's describing this kind of radical turning towards our experience just as it is. I mean, monasteries are also kind of dramatic, political, intense places. Like, I don't, like, I want us to be honest about what's going on there. It's um, other humans. So it's complicated, you know, from friends who've lived in many different wisdom traditions, you know, there's, there's difficulty and, so I, I think it's not so different than us. I think it can, um, I think it does take everyday training to be able to connect with these qualities in an, in like what feels like a satisfying way. It's very hard to just like kind of drop in once in a while. You really get, you might get lucky and kind of get a hit of it. But for most of us, we really have to like work at it, have that ongoing sustained feeling. Um, which I do think, you know, getting clear on our purpose and our motivation, that is, you know, in some ways more important than the practice itself. Like if we can keep in mind our core purpose, motivation, and intention through everything we do, like, do you even need to practice anymore? I don't know. Like if the core motivation is like really directing you, um, it's likely that you're going to be doing activities in the world that are of benefit to you and others and kind of clearing up all the junk of the mind naturally. So good question. Yeah. I guess I don't have a question. That's just comments. Great. Comments are great. Um, yeah. There's like all this stuff going on at my work that is making me feel like I want to just like lay down on the ground and, like beat my fists on the ground and be a baby and like cry. Mm -hmm. And so I've been, because I've been doing this practice now for a little bit, like I have not exactly done that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just anyway, uh, it was interesting because the idea of like a baby <laughs> came up, like when we were sitting where you were saying like something about like, I don't know, something about like, sensing through the body or something mm -hmm. and i was like oh like a baby where like babies don't worry about like their jobs or mm -hmm. climate disaster or their hair or like what any of that shit and so just but they don't even know language yet mm -hmm. there's nothing to cloud the direct mm -hmm. like experience of just being in the body yeah. and like being like curious mm -hmm. and in the you know and everything must seem so spacious after you, whatever. I don't know what it's like to be in there, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, you kind of do, you just don't remember. <laughs> yeah. But just imagining myself as a baby, but in not the pitching a fit baby kind of way. But yeah. Like, and I was saying to David right before, like, I know all this stuff going on at my work. Like, I know the way I should be thinking about it is with beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I need to go to work tomorrow and just pretend like it's my first day and I've never been there before and like mm -hmm. drop the narrative of everything that's going on. I don't know why I'm I, and I'm like, I, I can, like, I literally can, it's my choice. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's like my goal, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Tonight is like, maybe I can get myself into a space where like, that's the pain body. Right. Yeah. Like for me, it's like, whatever that story is that's going on. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And I love that kind of, there is an image you hear written about, you know, when you're doing and settling into your practice, imagining that your face could have the quality of a sleeping baby without a, you know, without a care in the world, like that softness. Um, but that also that pure sensory experience that's unclouded even by concept, right? Just experience. Um, that's a nice image to work with. And yes, like bringing us to the pain body. Um, last week, you know, we talked about Rinpoche has this saying, he thinks it can really, 
typify the Dzogchen approach, which is all is good. Like nothing here to get rid of, nothing here to change, nothing here to expect. All is good. And that's such a um, confronting statement. <laughs> um, but, you know, this idea that he asks, like, if we take our pain on the path, you know, as path, can it self-liberate without us really getting involved? And I often think that's kind of too high of a bar for us to imagine our challenges at work and relationship with the world to just naturally self-liberate. But he is also inviting us to bring, you know, the still these inner refuges there, the stillness and the silence, and to really feel that warmth, especially with all of them. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it's interesting, the pain body or the pain identity is, you know, um, just as Tara was saying, it's like this identification with what's wrong and not working, this way that we're kind of refusing reality as it is. We want it a different way. We're like, no, I just like, I don't want it like this, that contraction. And it is this way we carry ourselves through the world with these stories, but it's made up of like all these micro little moments, all these little episodes of emotion, right? That are kind of solidifying that pain identity. And it still blows my mind. I really hope one day I get to be part of this research, but that we don't know how many emotions people have a day. We have like a rough estimate how many thoughts people have a day, which is between like 40 and 50,000. It's really, like we really got to work on that. Because <laughs> like 90% of those are like the same thought, right? Like really boring material. Uh, but I imagine if we have like 40 or 50,000, let's say even one quarter of those create an emotion. Like that's a lot. It's a lot. And a lot of these like really small, really, really micro, um, as per usual, I'm working a lot with fear these days, my favorite emotional buddy. And um, it just kind of blows my mind how subtle it can like hang out in the background without an explicit trigger. And something happens and then it's like so ready, <laughs> right? You know, like I hear something, I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong? someone breaking in did a tree fall like what you know it's like there's so much readiness for that energy um and i think you know it's that's not a problem it's evolutionarily supportive to have a reaction to what's happening around us but when we get like stuck on the something's wrong something's wrong something's wrong it's kind of how we are seeing the world and again as, as terry was saying it's like unexamined we don't even we can choose to not see it that way, like we are, but it doesn't feel like a choice because it's a habit, right? And and habits aren't just, do I want oatmeal or scrambled eggs today? It's like, it's this entrained way of being and responding to the world that it can be invisible to us. It's very hard to experience. And um, it's interesting is when we're in, I think this like, like low level state, whether it's our frustration or anxiety or our despair, um, we often lose track of the body, you know? So ironically, the pain body, and yet if we're really engaging with this ruminative process, we're often somewhere else, which is why I think it can be so powerful to use the, the handshake practice um, to start identifying and working with what's here in the body. And the handshake practice is by another wonderful teacher, Sokni Rinpoche, who, gosh, it'd be wonderful if he taught here for us one day. Um, we read his book a couple of years back, and he has this practice called shaking hands with our emotion. And that's a very simple and very honoring practice. So it's this idea of really meeting in a very unadorned, you know, unelaborated way what's happening in the body related to our emotion. So it's not about trying to fix it, not about sending it compassion. It's really just what is this like in the body? <clears throat> and can I stay with this sensation just as it is without an agenda? Because naturally it will, let's not use the word 
self liberate, it'll just, you know, kind of, it starts to um, just starts to come down a little bit. It starts to resolve itself a bit. Our emotion as a physiological experience can only be perpetuated and kept going if we, with our thoughts, keep it going. So if we let the thoughts, you know, okay, no thank you thoughts, let's go full saturation of felt experience. Then we can just watch that sine wave rise and fall. Just watch. It's hard to do, but that's a, that's the invitation or opportunity. And it's, it's interesting because it's so counterintuitive to what we would think would help, right? We're like, Oh, I'm feeling extremely anxious or very lonely. Let me just sit with that. <laughs> like really unappealing unless you're in the in these dharma circles. Otherwise, what you'd really want to do is let me go call someone, let me write a journal entry. I mean, all that is great too, you know, and um there's other less healthy ways to distract. <laughs> but this way of like just staying and and letting the experience itself unfold is is quite radical. Um, and it reminds me a lot of the way some folks might be familiar with the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Tibetan Book of Dying, and many of the first chapters and the first thing that happens as we enter the death state, according to these um, teachings, is our mind, you know, is still ruminating at the same level as it is when we are here embodied, but there's nothing to kind of pull us out of it. Like some ways when we're in our body in the present moment, we can stop the ruminating. Oh, I'm in the room. Wow. I'm not actually at work tomorrow yet. I'm, I'm still here. Okay. Like the body helps us come back. And so that we really need to be throughout our life training that capacity to come back to the present moment, to find a home and spacious awareness so that when we are disconnected from the form body, we don't end up as this kind of wandering um, consciousness that gets lost and pushed around. So that's inspiring to you as a reason to meditate. <laughs> it's for me, you know, and I actually, some of you may know the, the Dharma teacher, Dave Smith. Um, he had a near death experience with a motorcycle accident years ago now. And he described like wandering there. Like he's like, Oh, you don't want to be a mind without a body. Let me tell you. Like it's hell, like just rumination upon rumination upon room. So it's this kind of unbounded experience there. And um, yeah, I think, you know, like what can we do about it? Like as Rinpoche said, is to just like keep staying, keep staying with it and cultivating that capacity to just be with it. And I, I want to read, there's like about two pages and it is, it's like, I, I don't know if he's saving the best for last or whatever, or just the cumulative way that he's built this up. Um, but I'd like to read a couple here, things that he says. Um, it's, it's quite beautiful. He says, by now you are aware that spaciousness, light, and warmth are present in every moment. These three aspects of inner refuge are found in every sensory experience in every thought that goes through your mind, and even in the places you would never imagine finding these qualities. So does that ring true? Like if we actually pay attention, is there spaciousness, light, and warmth in everything that we're experiencing, kind of every moment? There's a possibility that that's here with us? More or less, you seem somewhat convinced. <laughs> I mean, I think it's not as though literally there's light shining or there's, you know, an uncluttered space, but this idea that we can host whatever is happening in our sensory experience or mind from that space, from spaciousness, from warmth, from light. Um, and he says, <clears throat> Even in places you would never imagine finding these qualities, such as confusion, negative emotions, physical pain, and disease. When you open to unbounded sacred space, you can discover light within the darkness, solutions within conflict. But to see this way, you need the wisdom eye, the healing eye, not the eye of one who is producing the pain. 
And this is EYE, like the healing eye. And so he says that having a correct eye requires a shift in perspective. It's easy to experience spaciousness, light, and warmth in a beautiful flower or a majestic sunrise. But can you experience these qualities within fear? Even within the feeling of fear, there is space. So I've been like trying that one on because fear does not feel super spacious. For me, it feels like like there's some sort of like mild irritant that's making me itch all over my body. <laughs> it's like really uncomfortable. Like I don't like it. But like, is there also space there? And it's this idea that, and it does take, he says change in perspective. I think it takes actually a leap of faith to have a sense of what if I try to stay? Like what will occur if I try to stay? Will I really, you know, keep ruminating, keep ruminating? But if I'm just staying, I'm staying with these qualities of spaciousness, stillness, silence, and the difference, you know, with rumination, we're not aware and we're not present. We're just, we're not, right? That's very different than being aware and being present. So it's, it's like the change in perspective and also like the change of where we're focusing. Um, mm -hmm. When fear arises, rather than leading you away from yourself into reactivity and negative thoughts, it can become a doorway to your essential self. Fear and beauty both arise from the same space, the source of everything. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a hard one, but I love that idea of, you know, right now the roses are in bloom everywhere. You might be seeing it. And if you just focus your attention there, very easy to feel warm, you know, and kind of the sense of like, wow, you know, just beauty. And if it's, easy to kind of get ourselves into that kind of reflective quality. And he says, um, the ever unbounded sacred space of your nature is beyond distinctions of beauty or ugliness, pain or pleasure. Just as fear can drive you away from connection, beauty can too pull you away. And I, I like that point, right? So very often, you know, we want to keep making this world a more comfortable, you know, better looking, better tasting, better smelling version of our life. And, and it's, and it's great, but it actually can really be a distraction away from ourself. So can you Rinpoche, that same teacher who does the handshake practice always says, don't get too busy with samsara. Don't get too, which I always take as like, it's okay if your house is a little messy. Mm -hmm. um, like it's okay. You know, just don't get too busy trying to attend to only these, um, kind of superficial levels. I mean, a clean house is, is wonderful, can help us have a sense of spaciousness, but this idea that can also lead us away. <clears throat> when you see a beautiful flower, you may believe that the beauty lies in the flower and not in you. Regarding the flower as the source of that beauty reinforces your sense of self as one who is lacking. In this instance, lacking beauty. But the wisdom I recognize is that the beauty of the flower is also the beauty of who you are. Both arise from the same source, the inner refuge. Everything is of the same nature. And this reminds me of Raph always bringing us back to physics, right? And like truly we are of the same elemental quality, right? And so it's allowing like this one experience of kind of subject object. This is beautiful. I like it to become <clears throat> blown apart into a real experience of interdependence with all things. So doing that with the beauty and doing that with the fear. So he says, what happens when we perceive pain with the wisdom eye? Normally when we have pain, we experience that we are the pain. I am hurting. When you identify those space and light and warmth of inner refuge, even the blockages and pain, even when the blockages and pain are present, you recognize that you are fundamentally good. Um, and then he does the analogy here in these Oakshen teachings, the lotus is used to illustrate our fundamentally good nature. The lotus grows in water, and although the roots lie at the mud at the bottom of the pond, the blossom rests on the water's surface, its petals unblemished. Good. So when you're fully present in the pain, can you feel your lotus nature? 
in it is his question. And I just, um, this is not necessarily a new idea. You know, there's many psychotherapeutic approaches that invite us to pay attention to and, and be with, sometimes to interrogate, you know, is this true? Is this real? This pain, this experience? But bringing forth this, this care, you know, the same care that we would to something beautiful that we love. And I've been really um, reflecting recently on our presence is love, right? If we want to be in love with the world just as it is, it's being present. Like in, there's this quality, not of romantic love, but this um, this warmth, this openness, this it's like a way, there's a title of the book, In Love with the World by Minja Rinpoche. And uh, I think that's him recognizing this fundamental attention and awareness was everything. And in the book, he becomes sick and almost dies like twice. He's on this wandering retreat for three years, but he's in love with every part of it. Mm -hmm. And not like falling in love, not losing himself, but he can take every part of it. Uh, with his full attention, and then that it opens him to all those refuges. Okay, the last thing, and we'll do one more practice. He says, pain is appearance. And I think that's an interesting way to talk about it, meaning it doesn't have its own separate, solid entity. Uh, pain is, you could say, a perception as well. Blockages, numbness, and discomfort are appearances. Thoughts and stressful speech you have about your pain are appearances. All the challenging situations you experience are appearances. Okay, asterisk, you know, you actually have physical pain. Someone you love is in pain. That is not just an appearance. He is describing that the thoughts that we apply to it the way we identify with it, the way we kind of try to exert control over it. That's kind of an extra, that's this extra aspect. It's the appearance. All the challenging situations you experience are also appearances. No matter what appears in it, unbounded sacred space is unchanging. Can you recognize your unbounded nature? As we've been practicing stillness of the body, silence of speech and spaciousness of mind, these are three doors that lead to the recognition of our unbounded nature. This recognition cuts the root of suffering. When the root is cut, no appearance can delude or disturb you. By going for inner refuge and becoming familiar with the truth of your unbounded nature, you feel strong enough and brave enough to journey to the very heart of appearances rather than continually running away from them. Discovering the space, light, and warmth in the presence of appearance is healing. So this, this way, I do think he's like tying a lot of these concepts together in order for us to meet the pain, in order for us to meet this way that we apply an extra layer to what's happening in the world that kind of prevents us from being with the world. We have to have this trust in this fundamental presence of stillness and silence and openness and feel it as a refuge. Um, and that word refuge has a lot of, has a lot of weight to it, <clears throat> but it really has such a beautiful connotation. It's a place of rest and protection. I think for myself, as I've been, you know, continuing to work with the presence of fear, what's really at the core for me is a desire for safety. But there is no safety, okay. right? The teacher um, who I sit with, Jennifer Wellwood, has this poem, stop making deals for safe passages. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high, <laughs> right? Like, stop trying to create safety on the ground of impermanence and things changing. And so instead of like, okay, I will let go of my fear once I know I'm safe, <laughs> being like, I'm just gonna be with fear, but bring these qualities that are also here, which is warmth. And so you get out of this like back and forth and this kind of contingency. And it's, you know, um, not like, and then you secretly get rid of fear, 
but you have a different way of being with it. It's a different approach. It's a little bit less of a wrestling match, right? Or a balance sheet. Um, so let's, um, yeah. Yeah, let's practice a little handshake together. So the simple instructions for handshake practice, um, it, it really is useful for us to have in mind a recent situation where we felt lonely, despairing, frustrated, anxious. Anybody have any of those? <laughs> but choose one because we want to kind of invite it here so that we can shake hands with it. But I'm also going to invite us to choose a moment that we can shake hands with and kind of see, can we find that same quality back home of something that really lifted the heart, expanded the heart. That could be, again, just seeing a beautiful flower. It could be, you know, a friend who's showing up for you. Just like something that you really have that sense of warmth and joy. Could be a recent good meal, really anything that like, has that quality of, ooh, I like that, that's good. And it, I hope people have some of those to choose from. Okay, because it's good to have it in mind before we start so that doesn't get you distracted. So we can, I know we've been sitting, so if you wanna get up and stretch for a moment before we sit again. Do some shoulder rolls, help the neck out. And then just come right back into present awareness with this moment, with this body, with each breath. Maybe these qualities are still here with us, <clears throat> this natural sense of stillness and silence that warm openness. Mm. And with the handshake practice, we develop this really fine grained attention towards the sensations in the body, and especially how they may shift and change. So we take a first pass with this exploration of sensations in the body just now, noticing what sensations are here and noticing their location, noticing the quality of those sensations. Even in a neutral state, there's so much to be noticed subtle movement or warmth and tingling. And notice what it's like when a thought arises. And it's almost as though we get uprooted out from the body. Just seeing if we can come back in, pouring our attention and awareness in the body, just as we would pour water into a vase.
And then we shift our attention to memory and imagination. And we bring forth a moment, maybe even a couple moments, where we felt the sense of a difficult to be with emotion. Maybe we felt lonely or frustrated. Maybe we were worried. Just bring to mind that one memory or moment and for a little bit, we'll just kind of fan that flame, make it feel real. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was the content of what was going on? Was anybody else involved or just you? And for some of us, immediately a cascade of sensations will start making their way in the body. But if you need a little more time, just getting into a more detailed recalling of this experience. Maybe some of the thoughts that were present then, we could revisit it and notice them now. I'm so frustrated that. I'm worried that. And then all at once, let go of the thoughts, drop into the body, drop into the body drop into the body. And there may be some unpleasant sensations. And we feel and imagine that there is enough space to hold whatever is here. And we can host it from this deeper inner refuge of stillness and silence. And just keep noticing and dropping into the pure, mere experience of these sensations in the body. We may become distracted, maybe caught back up in the story or something else. No problem. Just come back. Keep dropping in the body. Keep hosting this experience of sensation without contracting, fixing. Shaking hands with the simple experience of sensation. It's okay if it feels strong, and it's okay if there's not a lot of sensation. If at any point it feels too much, you can always open your eyes, place a hand on the belly and focus on the breath. Just being caring and supportive for whatever's here.
If the sensations really start to shift and move, allow them to dissipate. If some of them are staying, no problem. Let's keep refreshing this pure and simple presence with whatever is here in the body. While well, having that sense of hosting this experience with stillness, silence, warmth. Instead of being that painful experience, we're hosting from the more deep nature of who we are, the experience. A couple more moments here, really noticing whatever sensations are in the body, what may have shifted or changed. And being curious, is there a presence of warmth and space here? Even with whatever lingering sensations, This residue of our emotion may still be with us. I'm not trying to push away or deny whatever residue of that experience is here. We shift our mind and turn towards an experience recently that was delightful. It lifted our heart, brought us joy. Once again, vividly bringing to mind. Recalling the details, what we were thinking and feeling, who else was involved with anybody else. And once the sensations in the body arise, you can release the thoughts, the images, the concepts. And again, return fully into the body. And we may find that we want to keep thinking, imagining, remembering the fantasy. But can we, with these pleasurable sensations, also find the deeper, stable presence of warmth, stillness, Silence. Can we host our joys from this place as well? Noticing the sensations throughout the body, the quality of these sensations, the location. Fully here with the experience. Keep staying, dropping in the body.
Well, it may be qualitatively different and the difficult to experience emotion. Can we feel or sense that the same awareness is hosting it? The same quality of warmth, stillness, silence. For some of us, we may be with both, a bit of the residue of the difficult and some of the blossoming of the enjoyable, and just allowing ourselves to fully be with what's here in the body. No elaboration, no need to name or quantify, just being with. Thank you for your practice. Yeah, I would be curious if people had any questions or reflections on that kind of weaving in the handshake and hosting both what's difficult and enjoyable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that felt like poison was seeping through my body. Mm. Like, like my blood literally felt heavy and congealed. Mm. Um, didn't think I was going to get out of it yeah. <laughs> at one point. I was like, yeah. how will I ever get rid of this? Mm. Um, but somehow, yeah, you said the magic words <laughs> of like space and light. Mm -hmm. And I like slowly transitioned to my brain. And then somehow I saw a little bit of light. Mm. And then you said, see if you can see a little bit of space mm. or feel a little space. And a blanket of space sort of like slowly seeping over my body. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then bringing up the memory um of some you know a nice memory also yeah. helped yeah i was like oh mm. <laughs> what a really you know yeah that was yeah well i'm like sorry but not sorry yeah. because that is what's happening in your body when we're not paying attention when we have physical emotions yeah you know didn't notice that uh, yeah yeah and so it's like, I don't love putting people into the handshake with something difficult, but you're already there. Correct. We're just not paying attention, you know, and to really feel the impact. And I mean, at a cellular level, you're not wrong. Right. You know, it is, it's toxic on the body to be overwhelmed by difficult emotion, right? Like toxic stress, stress is just an overwhelming emotion. Right. And so to really, sometimes to feel that impact can be a little bit of a, a wake up call. Of like, I don't want to be carrying this around, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that it um, opened up. I'm curious when you say in your brain, like, what does that feel like to you? Like, what is it when you said something shifted in the brain? Well, it was sort of 
that light that we had from the previous meditation, mm -hmm. I saw a little bit of it when you had said, see if you can find um, the warmth and the light. And I just remembered what that light felt like mm -hmm. or looked like. Nice. And then I pulled to that yeah. a little bit and it yeah. just came up. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, it's impossible to know our inner phenomenology, but I wonder if you pulled or it revealed that's, right. Yeah, like yeah. it's you know curious, um, and I I do sometimes caution against thinking it's the brain because then it's just up here. True. Yeah. And then like awareness could be everywhere. Right. But yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for the poison. Right behind you. Hi there. <laughs> it's nice when like when your best friend shows up unannounced. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're like. I know. I, I, I want to I want to surprise you because <laughs> we we were texting earlier. Um, so I was. It reminded me of when Mark Epstein said, "Hold your anger like a baby," mm -hmm. which I thought was just like a really beautiful thing to say. And you can, I feel like you can say that for lots of emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Hold your sadness, of course, like a baby, and. Yeah. Maybe your jealousy, it's not something I experience much, but your jealousy like a baby, just just going in there and seeing that challenge and just kind of giving it a good hug. Yeah. Yeah. Or like your beloved fur creature. Nah, that's very true. Yeah. Because I think which I love that um, you know, has been brought up in the song. Like not everybody got that experience, right? Yeah. And so whatever it is that that whole, that sense of just yeah. holding. Yeah, I was thinking about like those early experiences of when did you get holding and from whom did you get holding? Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting, but very beautiful to have both. Yeah. <laughs> and to see that they can live side by side, I think was also a really powerful yes. part of the practice. Yes. Um, Tig loves calling that Tig O'Malley, who um, sometimes teaches here, holding both. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Any other thoughts, objections, questions, analogies? Oh. One and two. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, I sort of want to give it up because oh, it's okay. I, I it's just it's it's short. Um, no, I, I uh, um, so at first, like, I was having a hard time coming up with something. I'm having, and I was feeling really like grateful for yeah. like, how my life Sign is. Sign me up for your life. <laughs> like, 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 it's difficult to come up with something really. I mean, there, if I go back, you know, a little ways, I can find plenty of very dark places to mm. to investigate. But but then I realized, you know, and I was feeling like there's nothing, and then it's like, oh my god, there's a whole bunch of a little tiny things, yeah, all over the place, yeah, right. So let's work with one of those, and um, you know, and 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 I was able to, you know, get in very quickly and um and and feel it in my body in a lot of different ways and and um but as soon as i got the instruction like to you know to just just to feel it and to not think about it and i was actually able to do that to let mm. go of the thought i i could not hold on to it mm. wonderful I, I couldn't hold on to it. and the same with the other with the with the, with the happy thoughts mm. right once once um I disengage the mind. Yeah. It it ran its course. Yeah. And that's it, isn't it? It is. <laughs> we can do that all the time. That's the that's the hope. Okay. So this was my question this week is like, are we also hosting our joy? from that same place. I was, was something I was pondering this week. Yeah. And so my question is, I mean, is the goal or kind of like what Grace was saying, like the end mm. to, to, to sort of be that container or whatever it is, or that, that holding space as opposed to it either way. And part of the reason why I ask is because in Sokni Rinpoche's meditation, he talks about, 
you know, hosting the difficult emotions or being with them and how over time, eventually there's an opening and we come to the open heartedness of who we really are, which to me seems to imply there's a goal <laughs> that the goal is not to be, you know, yeah. is that it's not to just be that, that neutral holding space. Yeah. Great. Claire, I always love your questions. Yeah. Um, no pressure. You can have a, a bomb question sometime in the future. I won't, I won't judge you. Um, it's a really, it's a really good nuance. Like, you know, again, kind of like, what's the goal hosting. And it's not like, let me never be excited about a rose again. Let, let it just dissipate. Right. But more like, what are the ways we get caught in suffering is, you know, that idea of like reifying the rose as the source of beauty and joy. And if I'm separate from it, I'm not happy. Like I struggle with this with our fog pattern in San Francisco in the summer, right? Of like my happiness would be if it was warm again, like last week. <laughs> and so it's like when I experience the joy of a, a sunny day in San Francisco, it's also knowing that it will like end and pass. So it's like, where are you looking at it from? Like he calls it like the wisdom eye. So seeing reality as it is, the cause of the pain body is ignorance. And the ignorance is, is not seeing that the most joyful things end, the most painful things end. And that we are something deeper. And so I think when Sokni, you know, the way he talks about the nature of who we are is he calls it, you know, basic goodness. Um, and that we are basically good. And that's the term often used in traditions would be Buddha nature, that we actually have this, like we already are that which is on its way to awakening. So I've joked before, like I love, there's a teacher named Anne Klein, such a beautiful teacher. <clears throat> and she talks about um, when she was receiving teachings 30 or 40 years ago, and this uh, great attained master would look out over and say, I salute you, you Buddhas of, of becoming, all of you Buddhas of becoming. And I like that, like you are all awakening Buddhas, but then to see yourself as that too. And it not being Buddha as in, you know, this uh, story about a human being, but as in there is something just as good in me as in any being who has been enlightened of all time, that that's already here such an inspiration and not like to make you strive like, Oh, I, if I work harder, I'll get even farther. But those qualities of like goodness, like they're infused throughout us. Like they're like woven in to the fabric itself. So we just like, we just highlight them, whether it's good, whether it's hard, it's just that. Um, it's more of like a clear seeing because yeah, like we have our wretched moments and we do, bad things and we say harmful things to people we love and like it's not that we're always acting as buddhas um but this idea that there is a place of refuge there is a place that we can come back to over and over and that's actually it's like our our birthright our true nature Will that clarify so like the goal isn't like go somewhere else and become this great thing <clears throat> but it is like you got to continually work on not getting so hooked on what we don't want and what we do want. Honestly, there's a lot of pieces to it. And I, I, some of it makes sense to me. Some of it I'm, I'm, I find confusing. And, um, my intention is to continue practicing because maybe in the practice that will sort of clarify something. Yeah, that's it. Right. And I think especially that, like, how do we hold what's good and how do we know if we're like doing it right in a way? Yeah. Okay, to be continued. Mm -hmm. Here we are at the end of the book, at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. And Rinpoche has such a beautiful dedication at the end of his book. But I think um, whether it's your first night here, or you've been coming for a long time, we can really dedicate the merit of any benefit we received from these teachings. And really considering, you know, the many months that we've been working or again if it's just your first night if there's any benefit we symbolically and heartfeltly we offer it up that any of this energy could be in service so that all beings would know their true nature all beings could be healthy and strong 
all beings could be free from inner and outer harm, that each and every being could be free. So grateful for you all coming here this evening, supporting each other, supporting the practice.